So the lecture question today, you have a you have a spec sheet of a list of behavior that you need to implement, and then implement a class with all of this defined behavior. So what we want to do is simulate a TV, of course, without control flow. So week is all about the state pattern, no control flow for the three lecture questions this week. So simulate a TV with a TV class, capital T, capital V, in the OOP.TV package with these five methods, volume up, volume down, mute, power, and current volume. And the behavior of these methods will, of course, change as the TV is changing states. And the states and behavior in each state and the state transitions are all specified in this spec sheet. So a lot of this is parsing out what's in that spec sheet, figuring out what behavior you need to have in each state, and then implementing all of that behavior. Then writing a test suite in the test packages, test TV. It's going to test all this functionality. And as always, only test the functionality defined in this spec sheet. So the only class that's defined in this is the TV class in the OOP TV package with these five methods. So that's the only thing you can test is calling those methods. So you'll hit the buttons, the volume up, volume down, mute power, and then check your behavior using the current volume uh, method to get that current volume. Very, uh, very much like the calculator, you're gonna simulate a bunch of button presses and then check what the display number is to check, test your behavior. In the microwave, you're gonna mash a bunch of buttons and then check the current cook time and power level and whether or not the door is open or closed. Uh, to do your testing. So same thing here, you're going to hit these four buttons and then check the current volume at certain times to make sure the current volume is what you expect it to be. Uh, I won't go through this whole spec sheet, but just a quick overview. The TV starts off at off with a volume of five. And whenever the TV is off, if you call current volume, it should return zero regardless of what the actual volume is currently set at. The current volume that you're experiencing is zero. When the TV is turned on, the volume is initially five. Volume up and volume down are going to increase and decrease the volume up to a max of 10 and a minimum of zero for the volume. When you mute, it's going to set the current volume to zero, but the internal state of the volume has to be remembered. So when you mute, if you mute while the volume's seven, the volume changes to zero. That's what current volume should return. But when you unmute, the volume should go back to seven. And you can unmute by either hitting mute, volume up, or volume down. In all three of those cases, volume would go back to seven. So we have some specific behavior, a lot of behavior that needs to be implemented, that needs to be tested uh, using this state pattern. All right, any questions on the question itself? For those of you who read through this, yeah. It should be whatever the volume was at uh, when you turned it off. So this is when the TV is first turned on for the very first time. It should be five, but then say you decrease it to three, turn it off, it'll be zero, turn it back on, it'll go back to three. It'll resume what it was at uh, before, uh, before it was turned off last time. So whenever that TV was last on, that it needs to revert to that volume. For the very first time you turn it on, Initial volume is five. So same idea as Monday, but obviously it's getting more complex. We're having more features. So making sure that you have that state pattern set up properly. If you design with the state pattern in mind and have that design set up well, uh, implementing the functionality shouldn't be all that difficult. And that's a theme with the state pattern. We're thinking more about how to design and organize our software instead of just saying, okay, how am I going to accomplish this one task? It's uh, breaking this problem into a lot of smaller tasks, and each small task shouldn't be too difficult to solve. Any other questions on this? Let's talk about Jumper. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's do this first. For those of you, I realize uh, not all of you have seen the full functioning game, so let's run the game just to make sure that we're all on the same page of what we're talking about. I'll go back to the slides and give the overview of what this game is, but this is a two-player vertical scrolling uh, 2D platformer. So I have two players. I can control this one with the arrows, 
And this one with w, uh, WAD, there's no down button functionality. And our goal is to jump in Jumper. And the goal is to climb faster than the other player. And once one player hits the bottom of the screen, that blue player is gone, I can no longer control that player. So the goal is to jump faster and higher than the other player. Uh, what we want to talk about today is the jump mechanic of the jumper game. Since it's the namesake of the game, the jump mechanic has quite a few features that you might not see on the surface. So for one, if I'm standing still and I jump, this is how high I can jump. If I'm moving while I jump, I can jump quite a bit higher. If I, just, if I hold down the jump button like I, I've been doing in those examples, I'm going to jump higher than if I just tap it real quick. And I can do a mid-jump. I can jump higher or lower depending on how long I, I press the button. So we have some mechanics in there. We'll go to the slides and talk about all the mechanics that are in there. Uh, but just giving you an idea of what we're talking about in general is this game. This is what we're talking about. Let's go back to the slides and see how we're going to build this functionality. It's, of course, in there. Clone the physics engine repo, that starter code. All of this code that we'll talk about today is all in there. So you can take a look, get your hands on it. I recommend, uh, as, as always, I don't mention this explicitly all the time, but get in there and start making changes to the code and see what effect those changes have. See if you can add new features to this game uh, or, uh, or break the current features. Sometimes just breaking things tells you a lot about how they work and gives you a better understanding of what's going on with it. So we already saw the physics of this game. We added physics to this by extending static object from platform and walls. And we extended dynamic object from the player class. So all of this works with our physics engine. I have my solution to the physics engine homework in this game. That's running the physics of this game for all the collisions. That physics package is exactly the solution with the extension of objective two. Uh, those, my players can collide with each other. I wasn't showing off that functionality, but they can collide with each other. Uh, but that's directly from the homework. I didn't make any changes to physics to make it work with this game. Just like anybody, any of you who finished the physics engine homework, you know that you can run this game, run the GUI, and it's gonna work just the way you saw it there. Um, so we saw the physics part of this. We used polymorphism and inheritance to get the physics working. But how do we get the jump mechanics? Uh, and here's quickly how we did the physics. I had this jumper object, which extends static objects just to get some ID numbers. And then platforms extend jumper object. Walls extend jumper object. So each platform, each wall is of type jumper object, which is of type static object, which means I could throw it in my world class, my objects of type world, in the static objects list. And then physics just works after that. I have. Uh, and then in each one of these, I override the collide with dynamic object method. I o override the default functionality, which is strictly for testing. That was just to get our physics engine tested. And now I override it to have whatever game functionality we have. So we saw that in earlier lectures. We got some nice polymorphism usage here to be able to get that, uh, that working. Our player class, same thing, extend dynamic object works with our physics engine. That's how those players are moving. That's how those players are colliding with the platforms and the walls. They didn't show off the wall, but if you hit the edge of the wall, you can't clip through or you can't move through that wall either because of the detect static collisions method that, uh, that was objective three in the assignment. So how do we get the player to move? How do we get the jump mechanics? That's what we want to talk about today and talk about the state pattern. So we already used a good dose of polymorphism to get us this far, but how do we get the rest of the way? Uh, for this, for the player to work with the physics object, and through all the stuff we'll see today, we're going to set its velocity, which will kind of be setting its intended velocity, and the physics engine will take over there. If the user has an input, tries to set the velocity to something that's not quite valid, the physics engine is going to take care of it with a collision with a platform or a wall, uh, or take care of it with gravity and change that intended velocity that the player wants to move that way, but the physics engine is going to apply physics to uh, to have the actual mechanics of the game. So we set that velocity with the three buttons that we have, either A, uh, A, D, W, or the arrows, left, right, up. And 
Each time the user presses the button, we're going to set some velocity or not set some velocity, depending on the current state of that player. So we can have uh, the user inputs, of course, and the states. That's the good stuff there. The states are going to determine what that button actually does at that particular moment for that particular key press. So just like the lecture question, we have a spec sheet. Here's all the functionality we want in this game. This is what we want from the jump mechanics. We want the things I mentioned uh, in there. First, uh, the key presses need to do what we expect them to do. Uh, releasing the keys need to do what we expect them to do. So if I'm holding down the, right, uh, the left arrow, I won't need to be moving left. And when I release it, I want to stop moving left. So that basic functionality, you might not think of it when you're playing a game, but we need to build that functionality in there. Key presses, key releases. We want uh, jumping higher while walking. Jumping higher based on how long the button was held, the jump button. Um, if we change direction in midair, that's when I, I forgot to mention. If I change direction in midair, so I'm doing a run and jump, and then I want to move, uh, go back the way I came, that should be a slower velocity than if I just keep going with my run and jump. So you have some cost to changing direction midair. Should be going slower um, in that case. Uh, the platform collisions, we have those built in. Uh, fall if we walk off a ledge. And if the bottom of the screen is reached, none of your buttons do anything anymore. You can't recover from that. Uh, so there's no going off screen and then jumping and recovering and coming back onto the, into the game world. All your buttons are disabled once you reach the bottom of the screen. So we could, if we don't know the state pattern, we're not organizing our code, we could build all this functionality. This could be uh, something we did in 115 and using control flow and having, it would be a pretty big project, but having huge chunks of code that build in all this functionality. If I'm on a platform, uh, if I'm running, have this behavior. If I'm in the air, have this behavior. Uh, it, it'd probably be a mess of code. I'd be willing to bet that if I had that as an assignment, the submissions that I get would be messy at best. Um, if, uh, unless you are using you know, some design pattern, some way to organize that code. Uh, it'd be messy. It'd be hard to follow. You'd come to office hours with this mess of code. Myself and the TAs would say, I don't even know what's going on here. Uh, with the state pattern, hopefully that's not a thing. You should come in with your state diagram. Hey, this is what I have. And we should be able to follow that logic with the state pattern. Um, and also, as always, this is a theme, as we're talking about OOP, very difficult to add new features. If I want to add a new thing and you have this big mess of code, if I write this thing and I got all this code and big, massive methods, adding a new feature is going to be difficult. All right. So, of course, we want to apply the state pattern. So let's go back to those, those three steps that I recommend in, recommended on Monday of how do we approach something like this. You have a spec sheet. This is what you have to do for the lecture question. Uh, Friday's lecture question will be the same thing. I'll give you a spec sheet like this. Uh, we have some spec sheet, and we've got to turn this into code, and we want to apply the state pattern. How do we approach this? I start by writing the API, decide what different sets of behavior should exist. Each one of those is a different state, and then the transitions between those states. So when I see a spec sheet like this, let's start with the API. What are the things what are the methods that can be called that I'm going to defer to the state for functionality? And if I look at the spec sheet and I start parsing through this and pulling out what I, uh, what I see, what the kind of inputs are, what, what is the outside world, how is the outside world going to interact with my player? And that's the three keys, which have different behavior based on whether they're pressed or released. Uh, and also landing on platforms walking off edges, and uh, just overall I'm seeing the three buttons when they're pressed, when they're released, so I get six methods there, and then when I land on a platform, I want to be notified when I land on that platform, and walk off the edge, I, uh, I don't know why I didn't list that one, I think I had a reason, but, uh, uh, but these are I can start seeing my API in here. I at least have seven methods in my API. I'm going to defer to the state. These things are going to do different things depending on my state. Oh, that's why I didn't do it. Because walking off the ledge, that's only going to be in a single state. It's only while I'm walking. Uh, there's no other state where that's going to be a thing. So that doesn't really have to be in our API that we're deferring to the state. I suppose the same could be said about landing on a platform. 
Um, okay, and then what's the, the different sets of behaviors? What different states can I be in where there's going to be different behavior? Where does the behavior depend on certain conditions that are happening in this app? And I can start picking these out. Walking, jumping, standing. Uh, while I'm jumping, during the jump, while the button's held, there's, there's different behavior uh, while I'm rising. So I can get that how long the key was pressed to jump higher or lower. While I'm in the air or falling, jumping up, falling down, in the air, walking in the bottom of the screen. I can pick all these out as scenarios where I have different behavior, different sets of behavior from the API methods. So I'm looking at these as all different states. The standing, walking, jumping, rising, falling, and dead below the screen. Uh, these are all my different states. At least a first pass, I know I'm going to have at least these states where I'm going to have different behavior for those seven API methods. Then my state transitions. This looks like the most text, but a lot of these are, are somewhat straightforward, I guess. Uh, but the state transitions, how are we moving between these states? All right, well, if I'm in the standing state and I press left or right, I'm going to be transitioning to the walking state. And I have different behavior, specifically my jump height is going to change when I'm in the walking state. When I release those buttons, I'm going to transition to the standing state. So in the walking state, left released, right released, those API methods need to transition me to the standing state. For this game, we're not going to have momentum. Once you let go of the key, you just come to an immediate stop. We could build in some momentum. We could have a different state in there. Um, but for this game, we're just coming to an immediate stop and moving to the standing state. If we're either walking or standing and jump is pressed, we're going to transition to the, jumped, uh, jumping, uh, the jumping state. If we're falling and we land on a platform, we're going to transition to the standing state. If we're walking, and we walk off a platform, we're going to transition to that falling state, jumping, and we reach the apex of the jump. This is the one that we don't have really a method call for, but when we're jumping, and we will actually need a conditional here, that's why this one wouldn't make a good homework or lecture question because we need a conditional for this one. Um, th there might be some really creative way to get around it, but I, I haven't found it, I haven't taken the time to find it, if there is one. Uh, but when you reach the apex of the jump, once your velocity starts uh, become zero, or the z velocity starts to become negative, once that happens, you're transitioning to the falling state. We have different behavior whether we're rising up or falling down. Specifically, we can land on platforms, which maybe we could have our physics engine handle, but we have other behavior that's going to change between these. And from any state, if we reach the bottom of the screen, we're going to hit the game over state. So this is my general approach. I'm going to pick out all those keywords. Okay, what are the what's what are the things that the outside world is going to do to interact with this object? That's the API. What are the different sets of behavior? Each one of those is a new state. And then what are all the state transitions? How what API methods and what interactions and actions are going to change between two of the states? Once I have this, I have my whole design, and it's a matter of writing the code to implement all of this functionality. So we end up with this state diagram. We want to visualize these things, and I highly, highly, strongly recommend uh, you write your state diagrams for the lecture questions, for the, uh, for the homeworks. If you come to office hours and you don't have one of these, it's probably going to be my first question. Uh, can you draw your state diagram for me? And let's talk through it and analyze all your states. So for this, the state diagram, we're going to start in the standing state. I didn't have my initial state here, but the initial state would be standing. If I hit the jump button, I'm going to be rising. If I hit left or right, I'm going to be walking. Rising, if I hit the apex, we're going to falling state. Land on a platform, we're going to standing, etc. I, I won't read all of them, I guess. You can, you can see the, the thing. Um, so I have these five, five states that I need. I have the state transitions, so I know when I'm going to move my states around, when I'm going to change state. And I can go through the spec again once I have these classes and once I have the API and the methods that I need. I'll go through the spec again and say, okay, what behavior do we need in each one of these states? Now for each one of these, I go through and that's where the implementation after the design gets a bit easier. When I'm rising and somebody hits the left 
arrow key, what should this do? When somebody hits the up arrow key, what should this do? When somebody hits the right arrow key, what does it do? When those release, what, what's the behavior that I want? Uh, and when I land on a platform, which I can't really do from the rising state, uh, what is the behavior that should happen? So actually implementing these classes shouldn't be too difficult once you get, uh, once you get the design there. When I'm walking and each one of those seven things happens, what should happen? And, and this is where we really see the leverage. Uh, we really get to leverage the state pattern because adding, implementing the actual features, we can start adding some really complex features because each time we're writing a method, we're writing one API method for one particular state. A lot of times, especially for the, what we'll see in this class, these methods don't get more than five lines. You, if thinking about my calculator or microwave solutions, I don't think I have a method that's more than five lines. And that's only when I'm getting sloppy when it reaches five. Um, the methods themselves are pretty easy and simple, short to write. If they're more than five lines, you might want to rethink your design. You might have some design, uh, uh, design decision that's holding you up. Uh, but the method should be easy. So if we did want to add really complex functionality, we have the framework and we have that foundation where we can build some really complex, really fancy functionality on top of this uh, without really getting messy with our code, without getting too jammed up with our code. After the design part. The tough part is getting to this part, getting to the state diagram. Once you have the state diagram, you know what your states are, you know what your transitions are, you know what your API is. After that, the implementation isn't too hard. Getting to this point, yes, that's where the difficulty is, and that's where it becomes a difficult topic. And once we're at this point, we get to start leveraging polymorphism again. Of course, we're going to have a, an abstract state class. We're gonna extend that class uh, for all these states and implement that behavior, but we can get a little fancier than that. and go back to our original conversation about inheritance, where if we have a lot of common functionality in two classes, we can factor out that common functionality into a base class and then extend that class in both of them. So for example, standing and walking are going to have a lot of the same functionality. So instead of having both of these implement state, extend state directly and implement all those features, all the functionality that's common between the two, let's factor that out, create another class on ground, have that extend state, implement all of the common functionality, and then standing and walking will just implement the things that are different between both standing and walking. So we want to go back to that leveraging inheritance to be able to limit our duplicate code and factor out the common functionality. And anything that's common between all or at least most of the states we can put it right in the state class itself. Put that common functionality right there. Same with rising and falling. A lot of the same functionality. For example, the jump button isn't going to do anything in these states. Not yet. Uh, foreshadow. Um, no, isn't going to do anything in these states. So let's factor out all that common functionality. Make an in-air partial state, abstract state, and then extend that for both rising and falling. So we still just have our five states, but we have these extra abstract states that are just going to store some common code just to reduce our duplication, uh, code duplication. We don't want to duplicate too much code. All right, I threw a lot at you there. Is, uh, are there any questions? Let's take a breather and, and think about what you said. Any questions on the design of this? This is the tricky part. Once we're talking about implementing it, there's not, not a whole lot more to it. But, uh, but designing this, getting to this point, getting to the state diagram specifically. Are there any questions on this? Oh, chat's pretty quiet today, too. Yes? What was it? Were you, are you saying instead of walking, have a walking left and walking right? Is, yeah, is that what you're getting at? I have a separate uh, entirely left and right, 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 right. Uh, I, 
I might not exactly know what you're asking, what you're talking about. Having a, a, do you mean different states for moving left and right? How would that replace the in-air state, I guess? Or do you mean on the next slide, instead of having in-air, if we had a left and right abstract state? I'm just trying to understand the statement. Yeah, sorry. Okay. If you were to have, like, if you were to have two separate diagrams, one on the, if you had the one there, what if you just had one and you just had the state for the left and right, and then you have the different one for the left and Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it, and kind of split this in the two dimensions. Have one for move, vertical movements and one for horizontal movements. Uh, we could, but the, the vertical movements can affect the horizontal movements. For example, when we're in the air and we change direction, we want a, that horizontal movement to be slower, depending on what's happening in the vertical direction, in the z-axis. Uh, so we, we do have some crossover there. We could try, there might be, and, and by all means, this isn't the only way to implement this, so there might be a, a way to do it, uh, but there will be some crossover between the two axes. So that would have to be taken into consideration if you do that approach. But that could work. Can you see that working? Any other questions, comments? Ooh, chat. So the, the standing isn't inside the on-ground. So this is the same as if standing, walking, rising, falling, and game over all extended state directly. This on-ground and in-air, the only thing those are doing for us is storing common functionality so we can have partial implementations that both standing and walking extend and rising and falling extend. So on ground, to the outside world, this doesn't actually exist. We're only concerned with standing and walking. Um, and these could implement uh, extend state directly. We're just doing that to save ourselves some extra typing. And now if we want to change both the standing and walking uh, states, both of them with one change, we just go to the on ground class make that change here, and then both of those will inherit that functionality. So for example, if we added a, a running class, a speed running, a, a P speed, thinking of Mario 3 uh, class, maybe we have a lot of different states that are all on the ground and still all have an on-ground functionality. For example, all of them, the up button is going to jump at different uh, velocities, but they'll all jump. So that common functionality we put in on-ground. Will rising, falling, standing, walking be methods? So they'll, they'll be classes, and they'll have to implement all of the methods. So all the methods that we have in the state class, the seven that we mentioned and any others that we need, those have to be implemented by all of our concrete classes. So somewhere in this inheritance chain, standing, for example, uh, with everything, all the methods implemented in standing, all the methods implemented in ground, on ground, and all the methods implemented in state, if we have any default behavior, uh, with all those methods, we have to cover all of the methods in the state class. All the abstract methods have to be implemented at some point, whether standing inherits from on ground and gets that functionality, from state and gets that functionality, or implements it itself. It has to implement all of the API methods one way or another. It has to have definitions for all those methods and behaviors for all those methods. Let's, uh, let's go to the code, code a little bit and make this a little more concrete before we jump to those next slides. So, so I have my player. It extends dynamic object like we saw. And I just want to define some constants for the specific velocities. Our spec sheet, it's not a fully defined spec sheet. I, I would fully define it if I were giving it for a question. But, uh, but I just want to define finish up what's the actual velocities for if I'm standing and I jump, walking and I jump, et cetera, walking speed. Uh, if I turn around midair, what's my speed? And then I have some methods that are just going to help me out, uh, helper methods we call them, uh, that are going to set my velocity depending on what situation is happening. So I can call those methods from within my states and get that behavior from the player class. So my states are going to call these methods. Nobody else is calling these methods. 
But depending on the specific behavior in my state, I want to call one of these methods to get that behavior. Uh, and a big reason for doing this, maybe I want my walking speed to be faster. I just change that number right there. Everything changes in all my states, all my functionality, whether I'm going left, right, uh, all of it just updated with that one single number. I restart this game, my player walks, my players, both players walk faster with that one change. So with the setup like that, it's really easy to make changes like that. I want to, if you're really making this game and you're getting ready to release it, you want to tweak these parameters, you want to fine tune everything to get that exact feel that you want. You don't want to be chasing around a bunch of code to make those changes. I also have a little bit of helper code here to tell me if a key is being held down. We don't have to worry about this too much. It really doesn't have much to do with the state pattern. Um, but suffice to know, I have some code here to, to know that when a key is being held down, normally with this, the GUI that I'm using, it would periodically call, uh, call the key down method, and it would simulate a bunch of presses. I just want to smooth that out a bit so I have, uh, so I have these key held flags. And then my API methods. If I'm releasing or pressing a key, if I'm landing on a platform, and I have those seven, so I have those seven methods. Pressing a key, releasing a key, and landing on a platform. My state, it's going to have those seven methods in its API. And it is live, this is just, uh, some I wanted in the game, I wanted the game to know if a player was alive or not, so it can say, it just display a message, this player fell off the screen, which uh, we'll be able to see in here somewhere. Just so I can put this message on there, player one fell. And you can see I have a little bit of default behavior here, when right or left are released, and I have the player stop. The rest of this is, uh, as I was saying before, is the key being held down? Make, make those press calls to the API. Uh, this is gonna get those methods going faster than my GUI updates the key presses. If you hold down a key, it's not just sending that key input every single frame. It has a delay and sends it like a tenth of a second or so with this GUI. Makes things sloppy if we don't do something like this. Uh, and then checking for my apex. When I reach the apex, call the falling method. So what that gets us to is making states that implement those seven methods that we need. So if I'm on the ground, there's certain behavior that's going to be the same whether I'm standing or walking. If left is pressed, I'm going to start walking left. If right is pressed, I'm going to start walking right. If I walk off a platform for any reason, uh, I suppose if we want to uh, have moving platforms that don't move the player with it and the platform moves from under, you might be able to go from standing to falling. Uh, so we'll put that in on ground and have that functionality. And we'll move to the falling state if you fall off a platform. And standing and walking only have to change the functionality that's different between the two. That's just the jumping velocity. That's the only real change that we have between standing and walking. So on the, if I'm on the ground and standing, and I press jump. Well, now I want to use the standing jump velocity in transition to rising. If I'm walking on the ground, I want to use the walking jump velocity when I hit that button. So we can make that change. And like I said, most of these methods uh, are one-liners. And if there's a state transition involved, two lines, one to have the functionality and one to have the state change. And if I'm walking and I release left or right, I want to move back to the standing state. And left or right pressed, we're just going to keep walking. Uh, we don't have to have the state transition. We can override this to avoid constantly changing the state and just do the walking. Uh, I'm displaying the state as the state's transition. I'm printing them out. If I don't have that override, uh, it's more of a convenience thing. It's just I don't want to see walking, 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 walking as, uh, as I'm holding down the button. So that's more of a convenience thing why I override those things. Then we have our in air. Again, not much logic to each method here. We could have way more complexity to this jump mechanic once, now that we have this scaffolding in place, this structure in place. Um, but we're going to keep it pretty simple. If the player changes direction, 
we're going to change their uh, change their speed. Uh, we're going to change their speed to the mid air speed. And if the jump is pressed, well, we'll ignore that one for now. If they're rising, holding the button for longer as you jump higher, sounds like a fairly complex mechanic. With a state pattern, no big deal. In the rising class, if you're rising up and you release jump, let's just cut your velocity in half in the Z direction. Done. We have that mechanic implemented now. And if you hit the apex, transition to the falling state. The falling state, the only difference is if you hit a, a platform, we want to transition to the standing state. So the platform itself, that's going to adjust our Z velocity. And then we want to, uh, the states to be able to handle that state transition and get all the standing behavior now. The platform's not going to know about our states. It's not going to transition our state. So we're just going to tie that in to have our state transition. And that's it. I have, I have some extra code in there, just uh, convenience things. I implemented the, the states, and there were just some things about the game that were a little awkward. So I had some extra code, like the, the knowing if the key is being held down or not. But other than that stuff, there's really not much there. If you looked at the going through the slides of the game and looking at that functionality, there's no real surprises here. It's I'm in this state, and this method is called what happens? Well, that's one of my state transitions. Transition the state. Is there any other behavior that I need? In this case, nope. If I'm falling and hit a platform, the platform's taken care of by a change in velocity. I just need to have that straight state transition to reset my buttons to what they should be doing while I'm on the ground. And we can see By default, I actually have this commented out. Uh, but there's this line here. If you comment in this line, every time there's a state transition, I'm just going to print the new state to the screen. So if I'm playing this game, I'm clicking the wrong thing, so I'm doing wrong. So as I'm playing this game, we can watch the states as they change. I recommend playing around with this if you're really trying to get a feel for the state pattern in this example. Play the game and watch the state transitions. And they all, I mean, of course I tested the hell out of this one, so they all behave the way we expect them to. Um, and we can watch that, that happen. Even when I'm walking off a platform, I can see that change to falling. I can see turning around midair is going to slow me down. We have all that behavior we expect. Are there any questions at this point or anything else you want to see in the code? Or anything I flip by too quick you want to take a closer look at? Yes? Just to double check, was the in-air class, is that an abstract class? Yes. It is? Yep. So it, ex it extends an abstract class, which would be state, right? Yep. So I'm extending state, which is abstract, uh, because I don't have all the methods. Actually, I do have all the methods implemented. So this doesn't have to be, this is more of a, like I could delete this. This doesn't have to be an abstract class, but in spirit, it's an abstract class. So I'll call it, I'll label it as abstract. Uh, but since I do have definitions for every method, this doesn't have to be abstract. I have no abstract methods because I'm defaulting the behavior to nothing, just so I don't have to have overrides with empty behavior. Just by default, the methods do nothing. Uh, and a few of these have default behavior. So that doesn't have to be abstract. This doesn't have to be abstract either. This is still going to compile and run just fine. Um, but in spirit, they're abstract, so I'll label them abstract, I'll call them abstract. Same with the electric questions. When I say create an abstract class, if you don't actually have it abstract, it's, uh, uh, and you have default behavior, it's fine. Uh, but in spirit, they're abstract. Once I have, once I don't define everything, now this has to be abstract, and I have to add that in. 
or else I'm going to get in trouble with the compiler. Hi, Doug Ribbon. Uh, any other questions at this point? All right, so one of the big selling points I, I give you for the state pattern is when I add more functionality, no big deal. So let's add more functionality. Let's add to this jump mechanic, add some more behavior here. And let's add a double jump. So this is in the game. I can double jump. With this mechanic, if you're not familiar with, uh, with any games that use this, when I'm in the air, I get one extra jump, but only one. After that jump, I can hit the jump button a million more times, and it's not going to jump again. And also, when I fall off a platform, I get that double jump. So I get one jump if I'm falling off a platform. So I want to add a double jump to my mechanics, where I get one jump each time I'm in the air. How do we add this functionality? Now, normally, we would add a Boolean if I'm in the air and I've already jumped, then don't jump. But if I haven't already jumped, jump and set a flag to already jumped. Uh, this wouldn't be too bad with, if depending on your design, this can be extremely difficult of where does that code go and how does it fit into everything. But the code itself wouldn't be too crazy once you got to the point of figuring out where it goes. Uh, but let's see this with the state pattern. With well, the state pattern, we have now another set of behavior. The jump button should do different things depending on a certain situation. In this case, whether I'm, if I'm in the air and already jumped or in the air and have not already jumped. So we should be thinking, this is going to be a new state. I want another state for this double jump behavior. And what I can do is add two states, whether I'm rising or falling, and after I double jumped. So if I'm rising and falling, those should have similar behavior to what they've already had, except the jump button should have that extra jump. The jump button should set the z velocity to, uh, to a higher, uh, to a certain, a specific value. And also transition to a state of an after double jump state, which is going to disable the jump button. So we would normally do it like this, just say, if I'm in the air and jumping, check a Boolean and set a Boolean. Uh, but what if we can't do that? For this one, it, it's possible, depending on your design, that this would even be cleaner and better, a better approach. But what if your professor says you can't do that? Uh, we're thinking another state. We have to use the state pattern like we do for these homeworks and for the, uh, the lecture questions. We're thinking one more state. This is a different state that my player can be in. So we're going to have another class for that and extend state again. So our, uh, our diagram gets a little more cluttered. When we're rising or falling, if we jump press, we're rising after a double jump. That disables the, double, the jump button. Reach our apex, make sure our rising after double jump moves to falling after double jump and not falling. And when we fall on a platform, we're going right back to standing. Now, we rising and rising after double jump, falling and falling after double jump, almost identical functionality. The only thing we want to do is disable the jump button. So we're going to extend rising and falling and just make that one quick change to our code. So in, give me. My mouse cursor disappeared. So when I have falling, when I have falling and rising, or rather in air, so both of those, when you jump, you're going to be able to do something. I'm going to jump with my standing velocity. I'm not going to give the running, uh, running jump speed. And then transition to that after double jump. So this is the same whether I'm rising or falling. What did I mess up on that? Oh, because I... Because I made that change. Um, so rising and falling have that behavior where you're going to jump again when you hit the jump button. And then my after double jump, falling after double jump, 
is the same exact behavior as falling, nothing else changes, except I'm going to disable the jump button. So I'm going to override whatever the jump button does with no functionality. Same with rising after double jump. I'm going to override, uh, extend rising, disable the jump button, and then when I'm falling, when I transition to falling, when I hit the apex of a jump, I have this new state transition where I don't want to move to the falling class because then I'd get another double jump. I want to move to the falling after double jump class. So not much, just a few lines of code we had to change. Uh, we did have to add two new classes, so if cl adding new classes is a big deal. The state pattern can get a little scary. But the actual lines of code of the logic that we had to change, I think it was like five lines total. If, if, uh, uh, it, I think it was less actual code uh, in terms of functionality than if we used the Boolean and just said, if I've already used my double jump, uh, don't double jump again. This is, just one last note, and, and then we'll get out of here. This is, if you're doing uh, calculator specifically, and you're working on that decimal button, think of double jumps. You hit the decimal button once, that means a lot. You hit that decimal again after that, a thousand times after that, that shouldn't mean anything, that shouldn't be doing anything. So if you transition to a state that disables that decimal button after it's pressed the first time, you can get that decimal functionality without breaking your other functionality. All right, with that, let's get out of here. Uh, see everyone Friday.